Thank you. Thank you for joining this uh, webinar um, that the IES uh, has put on to bring um, to you the highlights from the Mexico 2019 meeting. So you've heard from uh, Dr. Simons uh, the highlights from track A and what I hope to do is um, share with you um, some exciting findings from tracks B, C and D. So we'll have to try and compress uh, four days of scientific conference into half an hour. So um, I hope I will be able to do it justice. Next slide. So we'll start, start with track A. I'm sorry, track B. Um, next slide. I think, um, so here's an overview. I, I would be talking about all of the um, uh, areas that's shown here, um, but uh, we'll spend some time uh, discussing the findings uh, on the neural tube defects and dolotegravir, the WHO guidelines, um, the advanced study, um, some treatments, simplification regimes, both for naive patients and for maintenance patients. Uh, we'll touch a bit on uh, co-infections as well. And um, uh, due to, um, you know, the, we, as we want to move to track C and D, I, I won't be speaking on um, investigational agents as shown here. Next slide. So, um, the uh, first discussion is on uh, the neural tube defects from dolotegravir. As uh, many of you are probably aware, um, in uh, May 2018, there were concerns uh, as a result of the Sipamil birth outcome study in Botswana that um, there appeared to be increased risk for neural tube defects in patients who've been exposed to dolotegravir at conception, which uh, resulted in warnings issued by FDA and EMA uh, on the use of this drug in childbearing women. Since then, uh, there has been an expanded surveillance of women of childbearing age uh, exposed to dolotegravir, and a uh, study on this was published in uh, New England at the same time as the IS uh, Mexico meeting in July. Next slide. Um, there was a presentation uh, by Zash uh, that looked at the expanded um, the PAMO results. Um, and what this showed is that um, in pregnant women who have been exposed to uh, dolotegravir from the time of conception, um, five, uh, five babies uh, were born with neural tube defects out of 1,683 uh, exposures, which gave rise to a prevalence of 0.3%. As compared to um, HIV positive women on any form of um, antiretroviral therapy that didn't contain dolotegravir, the prevalence of neural tube defect was 0.10%. So there were 15 neural tube defects, babies born with neural tube defects out of uh, more than 14,000 pregnancies. And uh, in comparison to those who were on ephedrine at the time of conception, the uh, prevalence of um, uh, neural tube defects was 0.04%. And when compared to uh, women who started dolotegravir at pregnancy, the rate, the, the um, rate of um, occurrence of NTD was one out of 3,840 um, uh, pregnancies. So, and in comparison to uh, women who were HIV negative, the um, prevalence of NTD was 0.08%. So as you can see from uh, these findings, um, there is uh, a significant increase in 
neural tube defect as 0.3% at uh, in women who were taking dolatagravir at conception. However, um, when put into perspective, um, this risk is still very, very small. And uh, next slide. Um, uh, and uh, the, the in, in, in countries where um, food folic acid supplementation is given, um, the, the rate of neural tube defects is 0.03%. So um, basically, uh, the, in, in the, when there's additional um, surveillance expanded to uh, more pregnancies, um, here you can see here, uh, prevalence of neural tube defect was 0.66% in DTG exposed um, and in Brazilian uh, patients who were exposed to DTG, there were no neural tube defects. So as, as mentioned earlier in the uh, previous ZASH study, um, there is an increase in neural tube defect, but um, as, as mentioned, it still is uh, relatively small uh, occurrence of new tube defect when you put um, into a bigger perspective. So what this means in practice is that uh, although WHO has uh, recommended, next slide, um, next slide, uh, dolatagravir um, as first line um, treatment regime in adults and adolescents initiating ART um, in uh, women of childbearing age, it is important that um, a discussion and, and the, uh, uh, the facts given around um, the slightly increased risk of uh, NTDs in women of childbearing age taking dolatagravir. Next slide. Um, moving along to uh, the evidence for the uh, efficacy of uh, dolatagravir as a first line regime. Um, as you all know, um, uh, Favarenz um, uh, has been widely used as a first line, uh, as a first line uh, regime in many countries. However, uh, there is uh, associated um, toxicity and um, an alternative uh, antiretroviral is, is desired. And this is uh, a study comparing dolatagravir with TAF and FTC uh, in one arm, um, uh, tenofovir and FTC in the other, um, compared to standard um, tenofovir, FTC and efavirenz. And what this study showed uh, is that um, the two arms that contained the latagravir performed um, just as well uh, in comparison to the favorance. Next slide. So um, here's the, uh, the study more detail. So at 48 weeks, um, those on the latagravir with the TDF uh, and the amcitrabine arm um, in terms of uh, viral load suppression was uh, 85% um, and 84% in the TAF and um, emtricitabine arm um, and 79% in the efavirenz arm. Um, what uh, was seen was uh, a higher frequency of the emergence of uh, NRTI and NRTI resistance in the efavirenz arm and importantly um, there were more uh, um, reports of uh, grade three and four adverse events in the efavirenz arm. Um, um, one concern in uh, women in particular on uh, dolatagravir is the increase in weight gain of, and, and this is currently um, the, the uh, focus of more studies as to why this is so. Next slide. Um, another uh, a study that 
received a lot of attention is um, how can we simplify uh, antiretroviral treatment given that um, you know treatment is for life um, what can we do to uh, improve the treatment regime um, and one of these is a VIV uh, Gemini 1 and 2 studies looking at will two drugs do uh, in comparison to the standard uh, three uh, drug regimens and this is for naive patients um, where uh, dolatagravir and 3TC were compared to dolatagravir and uh, tenofovir and FTC. Um, and what this study showed is uh, there was no uh, significant there was no significant difference in terms of um, viral load outcomes uh, when you compared the two drug regime with the dolatagravir and a, and a two and tenofovir and FTC with very low virolo virological failure rate and no treatment emergent resistance um, occurring in patients on two drugs uh, as compared to three drugs. So as you can see there in the, at the bottom there, uh, 616 out of uh, 716 patients on the two arms, so 86% uh, achieve uh, viral load suppression as compared to 89% on the two arms, 89.5% um, on the three drug regimen. Two, next slide. Two drug regimen uh, was also studied uh, for patients who have uh, maintained viral load suppression for at least six months and uh, seeing how um, two drug, the, the previous uh, Gemini study was for antiretroviral naive patients and this is for those who are virally suppressed. Can we then simplify their treatment from three to two drugs? So this is for patients who've been uh, virally suppressed for at least six months um, in the TANGO study. Again, comparing uh, dolatagravir plus 3TC versus three or four drug uh, TAF based um, versus um, com continuing on TAF based regimen. And again, um, there was only one viral, virologic failure at 48 weeks uh, analysis in the TAF arm um, and no treatment emergent resistance uh, was seen. Next slide. Okay, uh, continuing on in the treatment simplification um, uh, studies, and this one looked at um, combination of a long-acting injectable antiretroviral therapy, uh, phase three study, the ATLAS study, um, which compared cabotegravir um, and ripivirin plus, uh, versus the three oral three drug um, ART. Um, looking at the tolerability, frequency and acceptance of the injection sites, um, at 40, from baseline to week 48, patients on the injectable arm uh, regimen demonstrated significantly greater improvement from baseline in treatment satisfaction versus those on the three drug regime. And uh, the uh, patient preference was high in those receiving uh, injectable regime. Next slide. Okay, moving on from uh, antiretroviral uh, treatment studies to um, co-infections. Uh, of course, one of the important co-infections is TB, which remains um, the number one killer uh, for patients living with HIV um, and remains undiagnosed uh, in, in people living with HIV. Uh, sorry, rem remains underdiagnosed. So there were uh, several studies um, on, on this topic, and here we uh, summarize um, four stu three studies um, from Sevilla, Caravega, and Mendelakis. Um, late diagnosis, uh, late HIV diagnosis and treatment initiation um, is still uh, a problem, and that contributes to high TB incidence. Um, and this is a four country study looking at uh, this problem 
which shows that uh, late presentation, not surprisingly, uh, when CD4 is less than 350, is associated with a six-fold increase in risk of um, incident TB. And uh, again, um, not surprisingly, avoiding late presentation will have the highest impact on preventing um, TB. Um, there was 91% uh, of TB among late presenters and 86% um, of cases in these studies could have been averted in the first year if uh, late presenters were, were prevented. The other study looked at um, optimum interval between treatment initiation and uh, it, TB treatment initiation and ART initiation in adults. I think um, several studies in the last, several landmark studies in the last few years um, have established the optimum interval between uh, initiation of TB treatment in, uh, in, in uh, patients initiating ART. Um, there is, needs to be a balance between um, the concern around development of iris and um, uh, increased mortality with delayed uh, treatment initiation. And so these were studies uh, in children and adolescents where the timing of TB uh, treatment initiation, ART initiation, is not um, as uh, well studied compared to adults. Um, in the six country retrospective study, it showed that ART initiation within eight weeks of TB treatment reduce the risk of uh, unfavorable uh, TB outcome by 65% in children and adolescents with HIV. Um, and pretty much like in adults, the risk of unfavor unfavorable TB outcomes is higher in younger ART naive uh, children. Next slide. What about uh, the choice of antiretroviral uh, treatment in uh, TB co-infection? Uh, by and large, uh, uh, efavirenz has been shown to be um, uh, effective in uh, or efficacious in patients uh, receiving TB treatment, but um, alternatives uh, to efavirenz based regimes are needed for patients uh, co-infected with HIV and TB, uh, particularly to address uh, CNS intolerance uh, with efavirenz and drug resistance to NNRTI. So this was um, a multi-country study to look at uh, an alternative to efavirenz in patients co-infected with TB uh, using Reltegravir. Um, so in comparison to 800 milligrams of uh, Favrans, 400 milligrams BD of Reltegravir with a backbone of uh, Tenofibir and 3TC in, in patients from Brazil, Cote d'Ivoire, France, Mozambique and Vietnam. Um, unfortunately, the non-inferiority criteria was not met um, where the virological response uh, in patients receiving uh, efavirenz was better compared to those um, receiving reltegravir. So uh, at present, um, efavirenz 800 milligrams uh, daily should still be considered as a first-line therapy for HIV TB co-infected patients. Okay, next slide. So um, in the last several years, uh, there's been uh, increasing uh, focus on improving um, TB prevention, particularly in treatment of um, latent TB infection. As we know, um, at the UN high level meeting in 2018, there was a commitment to provide TB preventive therapy to 6 million people living with HIV with um, uh, co-infected with TB. Uh, there was actually a pre-conference at the uh, Mexico meeting devoted to um, HIV TB co-infection and specifically on uh, uh, treatment and management of latent TB. Um, there has been a number of studies looking at uh, uh, new regimens um, in, uh, for, for treatment of uh, latent TB. 
um, and it has been shown that um, a three month regimen of uh, INH with uh, rifepentin is easy, safe, and, um, and effective and can be used with efavirenz or dolotegravir. Um, shorter and shorter regimes are, are being studied, um, including one month of lecinizid and rifepentin, and research is currently underway to look at uh, these regimens in pregnant women and children. Um, so long acting, there are also new uh, investigational agents, including long acting uh, TB preventive regimen um, and, and some vaccines, uh, some candidate vaccines um, are currently being studied. So I think in the field of uh, TB uh, co-infection and uh, TB uh, treatment of latent TB inf infection, um, uh, it's, it's really heartening to see that there is uh, a lot more renewed interest in research uh, in this area and I think this is uh, uh, um, an area where um, there's uh, quite a new, quite a lot of new um, research will come through in the next few years. Next. So if we can summarize uh, in, in track B, um, the Letergevir, um, all the, in in um, in a study of uh, larger uh, cohort of women uh, receiving dolatagravir, although um, the rate of uh, neural tube defects that zero point three percent is high higher than those who are not receiving dolatagravir, but it's very much lower than first reported, which was 0.94%. And I think um, ongoing surveillance uh, of women exposed to Dolatagravir is, is taking place. Um, first line treatment with Dolatagravir and two NRTIs uh, is currently recommended uh, from by WHO uh, for its low cost, robust, well tolerated, and uh, uh, less. Um, uh, uh, ability to develop uh, an NRTI resistance. Um, more and more evidence that two drug regimens are robust and can potentially reduce uh, lifetime drug exposure and treatment costs for both um, patient, tr sorry, treatment naive patients as well as those who are uh, virally suppressed um, and uh, as a, I guess a step down from three to two drug regimen. And uh, exciting new agents uh, such as uh, injectable treatment, which can also uh, be included in the uh, simplification regimen armamentarium. Some of the few challenges uh, around um, antiretroviral treatment is uh, the weight gain that's been seen in women, in particular, on delatagravir, uh, for whom. Um, uh, the majority of people living with HIV in Sub-Saharan Africa and uh, more research needs to be done on why and who are uh, the women who are at risk of this uh, weight gain. And uh, as I said earlier, um, there is a lot uh, increasing uh, research interest in uh, TBHIV co-infection, particularly um, better regimens for um, uh, treatment for latent TB infection, um, more shorter and shorter uh, regimens for uh, treatment of latent TB infection to enable um, scale up of uh, this much needed um, uh, intervention. And uh, um, yeah, next slide. Okay, so moving from uh, track B, clinical signs to prevention signs. Uh, there was uh, a lot of focus, obviously, uh, next slide, on um, uh, uh, key populations, uh, uh, transgenders, yeah, men who have sex with men, uh, lots of focus on uh, uh, PrEP, uh, particularly uh, yeah, its impact and uh, new interventions and uh, 
self-testing uh, also attracted a lot of interest uh, in how to engage uh, men in self-testing and also community participation. Okay, thanks. I'm going to, have to speed up a little bit. Um, there were uh, a number of uh, presentations and, and abstracts around uh, syndemics, uh, particularly uh, for MSM and concerns around mental health, substance, uh, substance use and STIs, uh, which can have an impact on prevention and treatment outcomes. But at present, um, screening for the syndemics in um, those at risk uh, uh, is still lacking. And uh, there was evidence of high rates of depression um, in, in MSM from uh, not just uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, but also in Latin America. There's still uh, low levels of HIV testing and condom use, and there are much uh, structural barriers, uh, including uh, to, to HIV and STI services for MSM in Latin America, low uh, access to PrEP uh, and uh, variable uh, awareness of PrEP in amongst uh, MSM in Latin America and I think uh, this is pretty much um, uh, seen also in other regions and uh, often um, the, the underlying uh, barriers uh, include stigma and legal requirements uh, particularly for young MSM uh, legal requirements for parental consent. Next slide. Um, the good news is that uh, from, the, from this Australian study of the impact of uh, scaling up of PrEP in New South Wales, um, the EPIC New South Wales implementation study, which had a large uh, person years follow up, um, the incidence of uh, um, new infections was very low and uh, in, in the 30 infections that were reported, all of them had stopped uh, taking PrEP. And uh, in terms of uh, the goal of HIV elimination in Australia, what it means is that um, uh, PrEP coverage will need to be more than 75% in, in, is needed to eliminate HIV in Australia and um, the need to improve uh, PrEP to, um, particularly for migrants and visitors to Australia and to address why and how, why people stop and restart PrEP because these are the ones who are at risk of uh, zero converting. Next. Um, in terms of new interventions uh, for prevention, uh, just as uh, long-acting uh, injectable was used as a uh, potentially as a step-down treatment or, or sim treatment simplification in those who are um, virally suppressed. Uh, long-acting carbotegravir is also currently being studied um, as a uh, potential for uh, PrEP, for the use in, in PrEP. And this was one such study. Okay, next. Um, this slide is uh, about uh, HIV self-testing and uh, in this Burundi study, how uh, peer outreach has the potential to reach key populations uh, who may not be in touch with facility-based uh, health services. Um, uh, peer outreach workers distributed uh, Oroquic um, and uh, in improve HIV diagnosis in uh, female sex workers um, and uh, as well as um, in MSM. And so uh, in particularly in areas where uh, HIVs uh, and, and key populations are very much stigmatized, uh, peer outreach is uh, one area of intervention that could assist with uh, H in, in uptake of HIV self-testing. Next slide. So obviously there were many, many more um, highlights in uh, track C um, that we don't have the time to for this evening to go through. Um, these are just some summaries. So gender affirmative care is essential for testing and PrEP access for transgender people. I've not had time to uh, discuss with you uh, studies in transgender. 
high HIV incidence in young men who have sex with men in Latin America and Asia, highlights the case for wider PrEP uh, scale up, um, as shown in the EPIC New South Wales study and many more studies before that, uh, the effectiveness of PrEP and in this EPIC study, it's a population cohort study. Uh, exciting new uh, modalities in terms of uh, ARV delivery for both uh, treatment and prevention, in this case, uh, carbotegravir for PrEP. And uh, there are several um, HIV vaccine studies now underway. Um, again, we don't have time for that. And um, in areas where uh, HIV is very much stigmatized, uh, self-testing um, supported by peer outreach is uh, one uh, way to improve case detection and increase uptake of testing um, in, in areas where HIV is highly stigmatized. In the last few minutes uh, of this uh, uh, webinar, I'll just share with you some highlights from track D, which actually received the largest number of uh, abstract submission uh, that covered social, behavioral and implementation signs. Um, next slide. And as you can see, there were, there were many areas covered, uh, implementation signs, uh, how to use data and program design, funding and sustainability, funding gaps and, um, and health investment, ARV tendering, uh, also received a, a lot of attention as did um, community involve, involvement in uh, program designs and prevention trials, stigma, and uh, also um, interventions to improve engagement in care, um, as, as uh, discussed before, reaching the untested and uh, reasons for PrEP discontinuation. Next slide. Um, I think I only have one or two slides uh, in track D, um, and this is about uh, the uh, how um, South Africa uh, managed to reduce uh, the cost of uh, first-line antiretroviral therapy uh, very significantly over time from uh, 247 uh, with uh, US dollars for a Favarin's uh, uh, based regimen to just under $80 um, for a uh, dollar tegravir um, based regimen. So there were a number of studies looking at um, uh, the cost of antiretroviral therapy. Next slide. Um, this was uh, a study on community invo involvement. This was uh, new in, in New York City um, where uh, young Black and Latin American men who have sex with men in New York City facilitated uh, PrEP adoption and uh, uh, it showed that involving the community was critical in the success of uh, the program where 82% um, uh, continue participating and report and, and high levels of uh, satisfaction was reported and um, three quarters of them would recommend uh, PrEP um, uh, to their friends to participate. Mm -hmm. Okay, next. So um, just uh, uh, to share a slight summary to highlight um, track D um, in terms of promising developments, uh, accurate and timely data uh, is, was shown to be uh, essential in terms of good programming uh, with that uh, you know, rapid feedback. And uh, next slight uh, involvement of the community as shown in that uh, New York study is critical for programmatic success and in other studies in terms of uh, peer uh, outreach uh, for testing as well as for PrEP um, intervention programs. Um, new, so numerous examples of successful interventions to engage men in testing and care. However, uh, uh, engage, engaging men, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, in testing, prevention and treatment uh, still lags behind um, and remains a challenge. Uh, next. Okay. Um, I, I think um, 
it, it bears re repeating that stigma and legal context uh, mutually reinforcing and, and one of the Achilles heel of uh, the HIV response, uh, exacerbate risk, um, and that legal and policy reform is essential for risk reduction. And that's it. <laughs>